Welcome to our 16th annual community-wide parent education event. Challenge Success was founded 16 years ago, and we've been hosting this event every year since. My name is Kathy Koo. I'm the executive director of Challenge Success, and I have to say, one of the perks of my position with the organization is I get to stand up here and look out at this audience. We have over 1,500 faces here, educators, students, parents, grandparents, clinicians, and we have a school conference that we're hosting this weekend as well. We have our school teams here, um, nearly 400 multi-stakeholder constituents, students, parents, counselors, administrators, and teachers. So thank you all for being here. We have a wonderful program. Tonight, I think most of you know that we are hosting uh, Dr. Lisa Damore as our keynote speaker. We have our co-founders, Dr. Madeline Levine and Dr. Denise Pope join us on stage, as well as two students from our school teams. Um, we have some opportunities for interactive participation, so we're looking forward to having you join us in that way. And I just want to take a second and thank our sponsors, um, Sequoia Healthcare District, uh, our individual sponsors who bought sponsor tickets tonight to help support um, a lower cost ticket price. And of course, all of you, um, we are all in this together to make this as accessible as possible to the greater Bay Area. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce to you our co-founders, Dr. Denise Pope, Senior Lecturer at the Graduate School of Education and author of Doing School and Overloaded and Underprepared, and Dr. Madeline Levine, clinical psychologist, national speaker, and best-selling author of Price of Privilege and Teach Your Children Well. Madeline. All right, thank you, Kathy. It is really great to be here tonight with all of you. And before we jump into the content, Kathy mentioned this, that we have a lot of different people in the audience, but we want to get a sense of, of who's in the room. So we're going to do a quick raise your hand if, okay? So, Raise your hand if you are a parent or guardian or grandparent of a high school student. Raise your hand. Okay. How about if you're a parent, guardian, grandparent, or connected to a middle school student? All right. How about elementary school students? Preschool? College or older? Okay, we have a really big mix here. Um, raise your hand if you are an educator. And let's give them a huge round of applause. <laughs> Raise your hand if you are a clinician. Huge round of applause. If you are a student, raise your hand. Big round of applause. Okay, now raise your Oh my goodness, welcome, welcome. This is so exciting. You are in for a treat. The theme for tonight is Kids Under Pressure. Madeline's gonna talk more about that in a few minutes. But it's this pressure that actually led to the creation of our whole organization in 2003. The idea for Challenge Success started way back when, when I was doing research on kids in high-performing schools. And I shadowed five kids during an entire school year. I went to all of their classes with them and all of their extracurricular activities. And it was really clear that they were under enormous pressure to succeed. And particularly that they had a very narrow notion of what success looked like. And I'll give you a quote from my book. Uh, Kevin, who's one of the 10th graders, says to me one day, I'm asking him, you know, how, how was class and what did you learn? And he said to me, people don't go to school to learn. They go to get good grades, which brings them to college, which brings them to high paying job, which brings them to happiness, or so they think. And over and over again, I kept hearing these refrains, and in our current studies, we're hearing the same refrain, that success is about grades and test scores and where you go to college and other indicators of performance. And in fact, the reason that we're called challenge success is we are challenging our society's current notion, uh, the very narrow notion of success, because we know, all of us here know, that real success is much broader. 
and it's achieved not just at the end of a semester, but over the course of an entire lifetime. And over these 16 years, we've developed a research-based approach to partner with schools and families and communities to embrace a much broader definition of success and to implement strategies that promote student well-being and engagement with learning. And we're going to actually go ahead and put a slide up, um, which is called our space framework, and, and the schools that are working with us know this well, but I, I thought it would be good for you to know this as well. So this is based on our research, but also research from lots and lots of folks around the country in the field, and we use it to help the schools develop best practices in each of these five areas. And we like to say that all students need their space in school. So let's just go over this quickly. The S is for the student schedule and use of time, both in school and outside of school. And we know that this is really, really important. It actually affects the whole community, what the bell schedule is like, right? We help schools take a close look at their schedule. How much time do students have to think deeply in class? How much time do they have to work collaboratively? How much time do they have to meet with a teacher if they have a question or they have to sneak it in in the last 10 seconds as they walk out the door? How much time do they have to socialize and make friends? How much time do they have for recess and free periods? And if they're older kids, late start times. How much homework are they getting? That's part of this too. And is it meaningful? And how many advanced placement or honors courses are they taking? And is that a healthy and doable schedule for them? So the S is hugely important. The P, also important, that is project and problem-based learning. And this is not just slapping a PowerPoint together or you know, some poster board with glittering glue, right? This is really going deep into relevant and challenging problems that they're actually excited about solving and letting them do the hard work that is very much mimicking what is going on in the real world. The A stands for assessment, right? A lot of pressure comes from the push to get top grades and scores, and we help schools look at their assessment practices. We ask, how many tests and quizzes do kids have each day, right? Is assessment all about getting the grades, or at your school, is it actually a way to help kids learn from their mistakes and revise their work and redeem themselves? The C is probably one of the most important ones, and I know that all of our speakers are gonna hit on this tonight, creating a climate of care. Because no matter how great your curriculum is or how fabulous uh, uh, the school is, no learning is going to take place unless our students and actually our entire school community feels like they belong, like someone has their back and they are cared for. And the E is what we're doing tonight. We're educating the entire community, and, and with this many people it practically is, to understand the latest research and the changes that we hope to see their schools make. And, and it's important for you to know that you're not alone, right? This is, this is a testament that how many people come out to, to talk about pressure on a Friday night and, and fight the Bay Area traffic, right? We, lots and lots of people are concerned about the rising pressure on our kids today, and we know that families and schools need to be partners for this work to succeed, and that's why we're doing the E. And we know it is succeeding. We know that in our challenge success schools and communities across the globe, we know this because we do research to benchmark our progress. When schools work with us over time, we have evidence that kids get more sleep, that their stress levels go down, they don't cheat as much, they feel better support, I know that sounds like, oh great, but no, really, there's a lot of cheating and it goes down. They feel better supported by their teachers, which is huge, and they engage more in learning. So we're doing some great work um, to acknowledge and address the pressures that our kids are under, but it's really clear that there's more work to be done. We have over 400 school team members in the audience today who have participated in our conference today and will come back for a full day tomorrow. Can you guys just raise your hand if you're part of a school team, part of our fall conference? And let's give them a big round of applause as well. They are doing the hard work to recognize that their kids are under pressure and they want to do something about it. And they understand that schools can be excellent and rigorous and wonderful places for learning, um, but also they can be healthy and they don't have to hurt and they don't have to succumb to the pressures. That, that you can have a healthy and challenging school and the two are not mutually exclusive. So thank you all for doing the hard work it will take to make this happen. I'm excited to, to spend tomorrow with you as well. Now I'm going to turn it over to my co-founder, Madeline Levine, to say a few words about the pressures that she's been seeing in her practice and how important it is for us to address this in our schools and communities, probably now more than ever. Thank you. Here's Madeline. Thank you, Dean. 
opportunities. Um, so my name is Madeline Levine. I'm a psychologist. I'm an author. Um, I'm a consultant, and I'm co-founder with Denise and Jim Mundell at this organization. Um, I think this is what I want to talk about. So I've been standing up here for the last 13 years, and Challenge Success has been in existence for 15 years with the exact same message every year. And that message is kids are being unnecessarily stressed. It's ending up with kids on, um, in, in the hospital with somatic symptoms, um, with a whole host of anxiety disorders and depressive disorders and eating disorders. Not, not that homework gives you an anxiety disorder, but it, it is a contributor and it can be a contributor. And in all the years we've been doing this, and so we had, <coughs> excuse me, Lisa tonight, we've had Wendy Mobile, we've had Ken Ginsberg, we've had everybody coming and talking to a group at Memorial with the same message, which is we're not about lowering standards, we're about being realistic about the developmental needs of kids, which are more than just their grades. So this group is interested, that's great, we sell out Memorial, um, but there hasn't been a way, in my point of view, across the country of a chain, a cultural change around what success actually means. Um, and if you talk to kids, you know, they'll say to me, Dr. Levine, you've really been snowed, that um, my parents talk a good game, but when it comes down to it, I know that the thing that matters most to them are my grades. And I, and I think if you think about this in terms of the fact that 24 hours in a day, period, it doesn't get any bigger no matter how many activities you have. And kids and teenagers have a whole host of developmental challenges to meet as they grow up. Um, they have to have a sense of identity, they have to self-regulate, they have to know how to become intimate. They have a ton of work to do. And I have the sense, clinically, that what I'm seeing is because of the increased pressure on grades and the, the drum, constant drumbeat of academic or sports or, you know, excellence. It's, it can't be good. You have to be the best. It's never good enough. No parent has ever come to me and said, you know, my kid's an A minus student, isn't that great? It's just where she belongs. Um, the feeling always is if she only tried a little harder, she'd be an A student. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but because of this sort of drumbeat, kids don't get to manage the other developmental tasks. And this is why we're seeing an explosion uh, clinically in the country on what's called emerging adult programs. And emerging adult programs are for kids who should be launched 24, 26, 27, but aren't. And I want to talk for a minute about why I think that's the case. I think there's something happening to a lot of kids that I'm calling accumulated disability. And what accumulated disability is, we, we all know it with little children, right? Your kid says, there's a monster in the closet. And you go, no, there's not. And you go and you look, and then there's still a monster in the closet. And then you take the kid with you, and you look together. And then finally the kid looks by themselves and, and then the monster is not there anymore. That's a small, small example of the need to teach kids how to manage their anxiety. And I know Lisa's going to speak about this at length, that we, we have forgotten that you can have a dis, dysfunctional anxiety, you can have incredibly functional anxiety. And in my going around the country for the last two years speaking to people who are in, not in my own field, heads of the army, heads of the navy, heads of financial institutions, what are kids going to need going forward? Because if you have young children, nobody knows. There is no consensus on what skill set kids are going to need. So what do you need at a time of great uncertainty? You need flexibility, you need adaptability, you need to be able to manage anxiety. And I think because we're anxious, and we're anxious because our society has become bifurcated, winners are losers, nobody wants their child to be a, a, a loser, so we're worried. Um, 
the, our sense of community is greatly attenuated. We don't all go to church or shul or temple. We don't participate in community events. We hunker down with our families. And we get anxious about what's going to happen to them, and we protect them against experiences of anxiety. So the, you got it about the, why it's not a good idea to constantly check your child's closet every single night. But then your kid gets a little older and there's a dog, and he's afraid of the dog. And you, you can either walk on the other side of the street, or you can walk with them and, and desensitize them. That's what we do clinically. We don't pull away. We get in there and in small doses increase the source of anxiety. Anxiety is something we live with. And if we don't teach our children how to manage anxiety, we deprive them of exactly the skills that the head of J.P. Morgan and the head of AI at Google and the head of AI at NASA and the vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff told me, exactly those are the skills that we're looking for in kids. Flexibility, open-mindedness, and ability to tolerate anxiety. And I think as we keep doing this, as we keep protecting kids, bringing up, which you and I used to do. Um, uh, I just had a mom who was talking about making her kids bed because lawyers are so busy. I have two kids who are lawyers. They don't make. The, I don't make their bed. Um, <laughs> you know, she, oh, you know how busy young lawyers are, and I'm like, actually, I do know how busy they are, and you shouldn't be making their bed. But, <laughs> but when we keep doing this. Um, there's a kid in my practice, what, what do I have? One minute. Um, a kid in my practice, and it's in my new book, and who didn't like sauce. And so her mom, whenever she had to go eat at a kid's house, the mom would call and say, my kid can't eat sauce. And the Wall Street Journal pictures have put, they thought it was funny. And so then, if you don't eat sauce, right, you don't get a lot of dinner invitations. And then the kid literally, it's a true story, goes away to college, and has to come home because if you remember what's in the cafeteria, there's a lot of sauce on things. <laughs> so she did no favor in protecting her child from the anxiety of eating something she was uncomfortable with. And I think we need to gut check ourselves, our own level of anxiety, because to the extent to which we're anxious, we're more hyper vigilant about our children's anxiety, we're likely to protect them, and it's not in their best interest. more where that came from in Madeline's uh, books on, uh, and, and, and they're going to be for sale uh, after after this session. So it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Lisa DeMore. She's a psychologist, author, teacher, speaker, consultant, and a mom. She writes the monthly adolescence column for the New York Times and is a regular contributor at CBS News. She serves as a senior advisor to the Schubert Center for Child Studies at Case Western Reserve University and as the executive director of the Center for Research on Girls at Laurel School. Laurel School is an independent school in Ohio. It's not the school here in Menlo Park, just in case you were confused. Um, Dr. DeMore is the author of two New York Times bestselling books, Untangled, Guiding Teenage Girls Through the Seven Transitions into Adulthood, which is fabulous, I highly recommend it, and Under Pressure, which is really what tonight is about, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls, which you'll get in the lobby and can have her sign after the event. While much of her research has been focused on stress and pressure related to girls, her work and insights apply to our boys as well as our girls, all of our children. We feel so honored to have her with us tonight to share her experience and help us unpack the ways that our kids are under pressure and what some of the solutions are for us as parents, educators, and students. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Lisa DeMar. Ah, thank you, Denise and Madeline, and to the entire Challenge Success team for having me here. Um, I have admired your work from three time zones away for a really long time, and I am excited and honored to get to be with you here tonight. Um, and I want to thank all of you who are here tonight on behalf of this organization and all that it does to advocate for young people. We are here because we know that so often school does not work for young people as it should. 
too many students, and I know we've got so many in the audience, feel stressed out by school, burned out by school, wrung dry by education instead of fortified by education. Okay, so that's the bad news. Here's the good news. There is so much we can do immediately to make school feel better for you students and for our kids who are students. I am going to focus tonight on what we can do to make it more joyful and less stressful, and I will focus specifically on your academic lives tonight. I want to mention that I have the privilege of returning to the Bay Area in December as a guest of Common Ground Speaker Series, and I will talk then about all of the other areas of stress in young people's lives and probably talk about school a little bit too. Um, so if you're not completely sick of me by the end of the evening, um, I will be back in town. So tonight, I want to focus on five things that we can do right away to make things better for kids in school. So the first, and this is to pick right up on where Madeline left off, is we can address really powerful misconceptions that now exist about stress. And one of the things that compelled me to write under pressure as a psychologist is that the way psychologists talk and think about stress is over here, and the way the culture talks and think about stress is over here, like a whole Grand Canyon grew up between us. And the way psychologists talk and think about stress is that it is a normal and expectable function of everyday life. And the way the culture has come to talk about stress is that it is toxic, unhealthy, and to be utterly avoided. This really does not fit with how we've thought about it for so long. And in fact, what psychologists have always recognized is any time you are operating at the edge of your ability or any time you are asked to adapt to a new circumstance, that will be experienced as stressful. So for the parents in the room, I know you have all had the experience of welcoming a baby into your home for the first time. That's a good thing, but it is a wildly stressful event. Stress can happen under excellent conditions, and it also can happen under difficult conditions. But to sum it all up, the way psychologists see stress is that change equals stress. Anytime you are navigating a change, you will experience that as stressful. Now, not all forms of stress are wonderful. Psychologists are not cheering for all forms of stress. There's two forms that we want to be clear we are not fans of. One is chronic stress, stress for which there's no opportunity for recovery. And in truth, I think part of what has us worried is that for a lot of students, school actually has become a form of chronic stress, and that is a problem. And then, of course, the other form of stress that we do not feel good about is trauma. We don't want overwhelming, horrible events. But short of that, truly, short of those two categories, change equals stress. And schools are in the change business which means that schools will be in the stress business. Schools, their job is to change students, to help them grow, to help them try new things, to help them do things they could not do before. So school, and this is actually the title of a subsection um, in Under Pressure, school is supposed to be stressful. So what is the benefit of talking about stress in such positive terms? I think the main benefit is that if we don't, we're going to have the situation we have right now, which is that too often, young people feel stressed about even being stressed. And that is not helping the situation. So why don't we just start with the idea, which is supported by decades, decades of thinking in psychology, school is supposed to be stressful. And the metaphor that I like to use when thinking about the stress of school is to think about it in terms of weightlifting. Weightlifting only works if it is stressful. And learning only happens when you are grappling with something difficult. You can't gain muscle without being uncomfortable. You can't learn without operating outside your comfort zone. So one way to think about school is that it is, in a lot of ways, a very long and at times, yes, sometimes tedious, weightlifting program for your mind. 
right? So we bring students into school, maybe as kindergartners or first graders, and we give them the work of that grade, and at the start of the year, it feels like a heavy lift, and they're pretty tired, and it feels like a lot to work out on. But over the course of the year, they adapt to it. And just when they feel like they've really, really got it, we take those weights away, and we give them the next grade level's weights. And that is what school is. Every year, you start with stuff, and you're like, I felt like I had it, and now I don't feel like I have it. That's the whole program. It does feel better when we just accept that that's actually how it's supposed to be. This only works, though, if there are opportunities for recovery, in the same way that weightlifting is only effective if you have a chance to repair and rest the muscles. If you are in the gym all day, every day, you're going to get injured. If you are working nonstop without any break, you will burn out. So my challenge to you students is to know how you like to recover. And in my experience, this is a highly personal thing. Okay, so let me take a quick poll of the students in the room. If you've had the worst day ever, and you feel completely terrible, and you just need to recover after so much stress of the day, raise your hand, students, if one of the things that would help you feel better is to go home and clean or organize your room. <laughs> okay, no, no, they're, they're like plenty, plenty. Okay, put your hands down. Now, students, Raise your hand if the last thing you would ever do on a stressful day is go home and clean and organize your room. Okay, this is highly individual. This is highly individual. So my challenge to you students is to know how you like to recover because you're gonna have a workout and you're gonna need to recover and you can't be trying to figure out how you like to recover. Um, popular items on the list of how teenagers like to recover, and I love this stuff, is some clean their rooms, some watch a lot of Netflix, which is fine if you've got the time. Um, some like to wrestle on the floor with the dog, some like to take a nap, some like to eat all the food, or all the savory food, or all the sweet food, or both. Um, some, and this is my favorite favorite, some like to go back and watch the stuff they watched when they were really little. Um, my favorite thing in the whole world is how many 18-year-olds are watching Mulan on a rough day. Um, <laughs> So, okay, that's the challenge to the students. Know how you like to recover. Challenge to the grown-ups. Make sure your kid has time to recover. Make sure your kid has time to recover. And a further challenge to the grown-ups, be flexible about what recovery looks like. Your idea of recovery might be a mindfulness program. Rock on. Your kid's idea <laughs> of recovery might be watching SpongeBob. That's okay, too. Recovery is what we need. When we reconceptualize school, as a process of exercising very hard, recovering to go back in for further growth-giving exercise, it becomes a lot more sustainable. What feels like stress, we can reconceptualize as growing pains. We can see it as a difficulty with a payoff. That makes it feel much better. Okay, a second thing we can do to make fe school feel much less stressful. We can protect sleep. The topic of sleep is so basic that it almost feels boring at times, and we can just blow right past it. If you stopped me on the street, though, and said, Lisa, why are we seeing so much stress and anxiety in kids? Just give me one reason. I would say, they're tired. They're just tired. And what we know is that sleep is the glue that holds human beings together. And if you don't get enough sleep, you will feel stressed, you will feel anxious, you will feel fragile. So there are a few things that get in the way of sleep besides school. Number one, there are some misconceptions about how much sleep kids really need. And I was so thrilled to come in and see it scrolling up here. But if you missed the scroll on how much sleep kids really need, on average, elementary school students need about 11 hours of sleep. On average, middle school students need about 10 hours of sleep. On average, high school students need about nine hours of sleep. That is a lot more than most kids are getting on a regular basis. It is easy to underestimate what sleep does for us, but I can tell you we actually know a lot about it because it's very easy to study sleep. All we have to do to study sleep is we bring you into our lab and we give you a fabulous night's sleep and then we give you a whole bunch of measures. And then we bring you back into our lab, and we keep you up all night, and then we give you the same measures again. So it's, it's a very straightforward research methodology. 
Based on that, when we are well rested, we are better at thinking, learning, concentrating, paying attention, using our memories, being creative, solving problems, making decisions, coping with difficult emotions, we're in a better mood overall, we have better immune functioning, and of course we also have more energy. Sometimes I think, okay, if you could bottle that, what you could sell it for, right? I mean, that would be amazing. So we have to be realistic about what it means to be tired. And we have to be realistic about its impact on learning and also on stress. So one of the things, I'm just going to put this thing on the table. There's so many things we can do to protect sleep. One of the real issues, of course, is digital technology. I think digital technology and sleep are like fatal foes. And we have to be really, really careful. And by we, I mean everybody. I'm not just talking about the teenagers. We have to be really careful about where digital technology comes into our lives. Um, I have to tell you, I am really, really not a prescriptive psychologist. I am the first to say there are a million ways to get it right. Most things will work out. People are highly adaptable. The longer I have done this work, the more convinced I have become that there is no no benefit and a ton of harm that comes with having technology in a room where somebody is supposed to be sleeping, any form. If you do one thing, I would say, make sure that when it is nighttime, there is no technology in a bedroom. And I mean that all the bedrooms, grown-ups, kids, dogs, if they have their own bedrooms, anyone. <laughs> if you can, there should be no technology in a 24-hour day in the bedroom. Using technology in a bedroom during the day actually corrodes your ability to fall asleep at night in that same bedroom, even if the tech isn't there. I know not all families have that kind of room in their homes, but if you do, get the tech out. That is the simplest, easiest thing that we can all commit to that will make sleep better. Okay, number three. I think we can really reduce stress if we get realistic about motivation, especially motivation for school. So ideally, we have intrinsic motivation for school. The work itself is fascinating. Teachers are creative and inventive in how they present their topics to make it fascinating to students. Students are open-minded open and position themselves um, as curious learners. One of the coolest things I remember learning right at the beginning of graduate school is that there's actually two kinds of attention. One is fascination and it is effortless attention. The other kind is attention attention, which requires effort. So ideally, we're operating under fascination conditions. And I know that that does happen for many of you, hopefully at several points in the day, and often at other times too, when you're not at school. So we want fascination, but when we don't have fascination, we're gonna need motivation. And there are times where motivation is hard to come by. So for example, when students are asked to work on topics that are just not their cup of tea, it is very hard to be motivated. It can also be the case that a student finds a topic totally fascinating on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but by Thursday, like it's not that interesting anymore. Um, or the topic that was totally fascinating at 6 p.m. by 9.30 is really not fascinating now. It also can be true that there are many more fascinating things to do than one's homework, right? Like many. And homework is often competing head to head with those. I can tell you, I love my job. I love my field. I love being a psychologist. There's, a, there's nothing in my field that does not interest me. I love my profession. I love what I get to do. Even under those conditions, there are plenty of times when I'm like, really, I have to do this? And then I'm like, really, I have to write that? And so you know what I have to do? And I am 49. I have to do, OK, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get some peanut M&Ms, and I'm going to put them in the other room. And if I can bang out 400 words, I can go have some. OK, I'm also getting paid for the work on top of all this, and I still have to use the M&M trick. OK. This is all to say it is great when you have fascination on your side. 
But we also need game plans for kids, and we need to talk with kids, you guys, about the fact that there are plenty of times when the motivation fairy is not coming, right? She cannot be found. She's at someone else's house. She's not at yours. There is such a value in talking about the fact that the motivation can be hard to come by. And here's what it is. Number one, it keeps kids from having to feel bad about the fact that they don't want to always do the work. I worry that we sometimes transmit the message that the ideal student is one who is really psyched for whatever we put in front of them. OK, there is no such thing. There is no such thing. That is not how humans operate. So the first thing that is really beneficial is if we just say, look, you're not always going to feel motivated, and that is normal, expectable, and totally OK to take kids off the hook in that way. The second thing is it then allows us to plan for when the motivation fairy isn't coming. Because whether or not she's coming, and in my mind, she's a she, but maybe you have a male motivation fairy, um, the work still needs to get done. So what I want you to do as families is to come up with your game plan for when motivation needs to happen, but fascination isn't happening. Here are some things I think are really useful for students that adults can do to help them when they're not feeling motivated. One of the simplest things is to offer your company. It really helps young people do difficult work, whether they're doing it in their room, not on a computer, um, or doing it maybe in your kitchen, or doing it in your dining room, to say, do you want me to come bring my bills and just sit across from you and pay them while you're working? Or do you want me to bring my computer and I'll just do email quietly while you work there? Not being alone with difficult work goes surprisingly far. Another thing we can do for young people is to help them arrange the order of their work. And I, I think there's two schools of mind on this. So one is you do the thing you want to do least first, and you give yourself the carrot of the stuff you like to do later. OK, that's not my philosophy. I am like the queen of to-do lists, and I like nothing more than crossing stuff off my to-do list. So for me, I put the most noxious task last, because my wish to cross the last thing off the to-do list is greater than my wish to not do that thing. So think with your young person about how to do it. Another tactic for when the motivation fairy isn't coming is what I call it a 25-5 system. Say to your kid, look, give me your phone. Let's set a timer. I will hold it for 25 minutes. You work in a focused way for 25 minutes. And after 25 minutes, I will bring you your phone. Go nuts. Look at everything you want. Do whatever you wanted to do. Do it for a good five minutes. Give me back the phone. We'll do another round 25-5. It is such a gift to just have a coach, some structure, some cheerleading about how hard it is to focus. Um, obviously, chocolate is probably the best strategy. Um, I, really, I really mean it, though. If your student or if you are a student doing work that just feels so tedious, it is not stooping to say, if I do five problems, I get two M&Ms. Do five more problems, two more M&Ms. This is not stooping. This is strategy. It is. It is. And here's what I have found in my work. The kids for whom school feels most manageable are not the kids with the highest IQs. School is most manageable for the kids who have the best strategies for motivating themselves to do the work they don't feel like doing. And we should just talk openly about the fact that that is what academic success often requires. OK, the fourth thing we can do. We, as adults, have to set down what I call the markless whip of disappointment. We have to put it away. I think so often in parenting, and I'm a parent, and I am guilty of this at times, I know, our lips say one thing, like, look, really, all that matters is that you gave it your best effort, right? While our eyes say something else altogether, like, gosh, you really blew that quiz. <laughs> given, and you, you students know this, given that our kids know us so much better than we will ever know ourselves, we have to be realistic that we are not always sending the messages we would like to think we are sending. This is something that also happens at school, too, where teachers transmit disappointment 
when students aren't doing what they wish the students were doing. Um, in fact, I know there are some teachers who actually say, I was disappointed in your last test grade. Um, I have zero patience for this. Um, it is not the student's job to help a teacher feel good. It is not. And when a teacher expresses disappointment as a way to get a student in line, that to me is, I think, a high crime in an academic setting. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Um, but teachers don't have to be that outright. And I, I, these are all crimes all adults commit. I, I, I know it happens. Um, there are subtle ways that teachers can use the markless whip of disappointment. So I think sometimes about maybe if a student says, you know, um, my grandma's been in the hospital, things have not been good, I've got a huge amount going on, and this is a diligent, conscientious student who usually gets everything in on time. And the student says, you know, would it be okay if I had another day or so on the paper? I think sometimes teachers go, um, well, okay. Right? At that point, I feel like, don't even bother. Like, it's already been communicated that this is really not okay. So this is something that we adults can do instantly to make school better for kids. Now, the hard part is it's kind of unconscious on our part. I think we don't always realize we're doing it. So how do we commit to stop doing something we're not always aware of doing? One thing I have found that can be effective is we commit to doing its opposite, which is we get really thoughtful about what we praise in young people. If we're trying not to communicate disappointment, let's think about what we praise. Traditionally, we have yielded, we wielded praise for things like high grades or incredible discipline. And I think we all know, and we're all here tonight, that that actually usually makes things worse. So what I think about a lot right now is what we praise in students and how we can use what we praise to reduce stress. So if disappointment increases stress, however we happen to express it, we can use praise, its opposite, to reduce stress. So let me give you a list of the kinds of things I think we should be praising in young people. It often happens that a student is in a class that at first they don't think they like it, and they're not getting it, and they're not that into it, but they keep themselves open enough that they start to find what it is in that class that's exciting to them. Anytime a student does this, we should be admiring and praising it. It also sometimes happens that students have teachers who are really not their cup of tea. And I think one of the hardest things in school is to work really, really diligently in the absence of a meaningful relationship. And that is something sometimes students have to do. And when students do it, I think they should be praised. It is easy to do good work for teachers you like. It is hard to do good te work for teachers where there's not a good fit. And this is something we can praise. I also think we should admire when our kid comes home and says, you know what, my friends have all decided to sign up for these four APs. That's not going to be me. That's not going to work for me. That's not what I want. This is something we should praise. Another thing I think we should praise, and I also think you should, I hope you all have the time to do it, students. I love it when students cultivate hobbies that will never show up on a college application. I think every one of you should have your secret, private hobby or pursuit. Um, my favorite example I came across recently, um, a very talented violinist, a young woman in New Jersey, who on her own time figures out how to play all of the most popular radio songs on her violin. She does this for no one but herself. And, and I think this is the kind of thing we should make a point of admiring. The last thing on this list, but I want you just to build and build this list, is we should praise when students are efficient. I think too often we praise inefficiency. So students, you know, maybe will assign that you do 20 flashcards and you show up with 40 flashcards and we're like, wow, that's amazing, right? I think a teacher should instead say, tell me why you made 40 flashcards when I only assigned 20. The only acceptable answer to that question is, I love this class so much I could not stop myself, or I love the topic so much I could not stop myself. What should happen is the teacher should say, if they don't get that answer, don't do more than I'm asking. I think too often we praise inefficiency. An alternative, a way to praise efficiency, would be if we said to our kid, 
you know, I saw that you thought you had a pretty good sense of how you were going to do on that test, and so you went online and found three sample tests and took them, and you crushed them, and so you did not study any further. That is some good work. That kind of efficiency is what I would like for us to be praising. All right, the fifth and final thing we can do to relieve pressure on young people. We can take a real look at the data on adult well-being. And here's what I mean. So often, when kids are feeling pressure to exceed you know, and succeed at these incredible levels academically, it's with the idea that that will be what leads to adult well-being. Right? We adults, we want one thing for our kids and one thing only, which is that they be happy as grown-ups. That is the universal of parenting. We just want them to grow up to be happy and secure and have high levels of well-being. So one thing that adults do is we think, okay, well, my kid will be secure and have high levels of well-being if they are professionally or economically successful. Right? That's the assumption we make. And then we start to backwards engineer from that point. So we think, okay, they'll be professionally or economically successful if they go to a good college. Okay, so if they go to a good college, they'll get this outcome I want. Okay, so how do they get to a good college? Well, that will depend on their grades right now. And then that comes down to whatever you got on that quiz today. So it is coming from a loving place. I really believe it comes from a loving place. All that curiosity about what you got on that quiz today is about this long away, far away goal that we all have for our kids. Here's what's really interesting. We have the data, and it turns out that economic and professional success are basically uncorrelated with adult well-being. Here's, I'm gonna do a graph, and I'm gonna do it your direction. If this is income, and this is well-being, there's a very steep line if you are impoverished. If you are poor, your well-being is low, and as your income goes up, so does your well-being. And then, once you are comfortably above the poverty level, the line levels off. You can have 100,000, 200,000, a million, two million dollars. There is no additional benefit to well-being, and we increasingly have data that actually things can get ugly over here. So this assumption that the goal to my kid's long-term well-being is the A on the test today isn't even supported by the data. All right. Here's what's cool. So psychologists have figured out, well, what is correlated with well-being? How do we get there? If this is the goal we want for our kids, what, what is the deal? So we know. We know exactly what is associated with well-being in adulthood, and it's four things. First, that you have high-quality relationships. Second, that you do work that you find meaningful. Third, that you feel like you're good at your job that you, you know, you're qualified and, and, and competent in the thing that you've dedicated yourself to. And the fourth is physical health, which is not a big surprise. That's actually the target for adult well-being. So then you think, well, how do I backwards engineer all of that? OK, we have the answer. It turns out that the main factor in childhood and adolescence that is correlated with these terrific well-being outcomes is conscientiousness being a kind, decent, ethical person, being long on character. If you are kind, decent, and ethical, you tend to have good relationships, you tend to do meaningful work, you tend to be decent at your job, and it can contribute to long-term health. So we all want the same thing. We all want the same thing, which is for all these fabulous young people in this audience to grow up to be secure, and happy grown-ups. And so to get there, we have to focus on character. We have to focus on decency. So as parents, what does this mean? It means that we have high standards for ethical behavior and we hold kids to them. More than that, we model ethical behavior. We articulate our values by living our values. And I do feel if you tell your kid you want them to be ethical but you yourself are not ethical, you're actually just making it way worse. So my advice to adults can actually be summed up quite simply. Um, don't be shady, right? It's really important you not be shady. Um, if you're shady, your kid's probably going to be shady, whatever else you're saying. Um, 
And what I can tell you is if we focus on character, if we focus on decency, if we focus on being a conscientious, upstanding person, we will get the outcome we all want for young people, which is they live lives that are fulfilling and meaningful. Thank you. Very, very wise, wise words uh, to live by. And uh, to have some conversation about that, I have invited, in addition to Madeline and Lisa, two amazing students who have participated in our Challenge Success program. And I am going to actually let them each introduce themselves. And we're going to do a little chatting. And then we're going to bring Lisa and Madeline in as well. So let's start with Mary. Uh, Mary, tell us who you are. Tell us where you're from, your, your grade, the school, the city, et cetera. And um, a little bit about how you have experienced pressure or stress. Well, I'm Mary Norman. And I'm from Foothill High School in Tustin, California. <laughs> I'm a, currently a senior there this year and was on the founding Challenge Success Committee at my school where we implemented a ton of the program's ideas into our new school and what we're doing and had success in doing so. And with, and I'm here for the conference this weekend, which is exciting. <laughs> and for pressure at school, I think I speak for a majority of students when I say kids are under a ton of pressure. And that puts them on edge in and out of the classroom because kids are held to just extreme expectations and unrealistic expectations. And it's just horrible how, sorry. <laughs> There's some water right there. No, I'm okay. Um, but so kids are held to unrealistic expectations, and they have to sacrifice personal interests to do things that they think their parents want them to do or their teachers want them to do. So they fill their college apps and their schedules with rigorous courses and, and being on the band and sports when, in fact, they're not interested in all of those things. And in that way, they're sacrificing what they really love to do. Yeah, thank you, Mary. We definitely heard some of that uh, tonight. Um, AJ, you want to introduce yourself? Tell us where you're from. Hi, I'm AJ Mendoli. I'm from All Saints Episcopal School in Fort Worth, Texas. So, Yay, All Saints. So um, more of a personal story from my side. I, um, when it was last year in the spring during baseball season that I play baseball, um, and I was coming home from a game, and the night before, I had stayed up till about 2 a.m. working on homework and studying for exams and prepping for classes the next day. And um, then the next day after um, this happened, I had a big presentation for a very important class that um, I deemed very important um, and also my parents did as well. Um, but this presentation was a pass or fail opportunity it kind of made the class, it wasn't the only piece that made the class, but it was one of the main pieces. Um, it was one of the three pieces. So it was very important to me that I was, and I was very stressed to make sure I got it done and um, did it to my best ability. So I was really stressed on the day before, which was the day I was coming home. So I'm coming home from my baseball game and a road that I travel every day from the school to get home. It's a little backcountry road. Um, I was going about 50 miles an hour and then um, I fell asleep behind the wheel. Um, I, sw I went off the road while I was asleep, went through a barbed wire fence and hit a tree head on about 50 miles an hour. Um, I didn't really have time to react and um, didn't have time to hit the brakes because I woke up right before when I was going through the barbed wire fence and then hit the tree. So um, that's a personal story for myself about um, how stress and pressure has affected my life, luckily coming away from the um, accident alive, um, I only came away, I had two bruises and a scratch on my hand and the only reason I had the scratch was getting out of the car because my car was surrounded in barbed wire. Um, <laughs> but um, that's, that's just a personal story from how stress and pressure affected me. Thank you for, for telling us that story, it's really powerful. I know something that we talk about, AJ, at Challenge Success is this notion of, of balance and finding balance, especially after that. How, what, what does that mean to you? Absolutely. I, um, 
especially after that, really balance for me since I am a student athlete um, and having to balance school and athletics, it's a big thing that a lot of people have to do because a lot of people participate in high school sports and middle school um, sports as well. But in high school, it's really big because you, you're fighting to um, get a job on, say, a varsity or junior varsity team, and you're trying to put in as much work as you are in the classroom as well. So, um, but the big thing for me was I had to find a balance where I could not only get the schoolwork done and the athletics done, but after that accident, I had to find room in that for sleep. And so one big thing for me was if I got to a point in the night, I, it was like 11.30 and I knew I had time after, an email for the class that I wasn't going to finish the work for was sent to a teacher. And most of the teachers at our school are um, really good about checking their emails when they get in the school in the morning. And so you can go in in the mornings, talk to them. If you had already sent them an email, you just come back and talk to them again. But one big thing, that, especially for me, was having a time to cut off schoolwork and be able in sports and be able to just go to sleep and get that sleep so I don't have that accident again. That makes me really happy. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that. Um, Mary, tell us a little bit about what balance means to you and also any changes that you've personally um, done since being involved with Challenge Success or even changes at your school. Well, I think being a well-balanced student to me means finding the middle ground between childhood and adulthood, especially for high schoolers. And I think a lot of high schoolers are forced to grow up too quickly and they sacrifice playtime and family time and downtime. And being able to allocate time for that in your schedule, as well as the responsibility of the growing adult you are becoming is very important for becoming a well-balanced student. And some challenges that we've made at my school is we have tried to create a more relaxed schedule. So we flipped our lunch and our break schedule. So we have lunch earlier in the day. And we have also allocated time for tutorial every day at school. This makes our school day feel longer and therefore kids have more time to get their work done and are not stressed and just going to school, going to class and going home. And I think that was a big help. It was very important at our school. We also implemented a seven minute passing period so kids have time to decompress after class and can talk to their friends, get a sip of water and not have to rush between classes from doing poetry in English and then going to doing fractions and math because your brain can't switch that fast. And we also have late starts every Wednesday now and I know all of the kids at my school just love it because it's late start. <laughs> so they love you because you were on the town success committee too to make these things happen. So just um, tutorial is what? Just a quick uh, explanation of that. Tutorial is after our fourth period every day. It's a study time. I think it's about 25 minutes. You can go to any class, get help from teachers, do your homework, and that way students have time to get some of their homework done at school and are less stressed when they get home and have to do it. It works, see the system works. <laughs> um, thank you, Mary. AJ, uh, any changes going on at All Saints? Yeah, we, uh, along with her, we have a longer passing period, so it's five minutes, same, same idea, so you can go and not have that stress of going straight from class to class to class and being able to maybe see a friend in the hallway, say hi, have a little small conversation before you go to the next class. Um, one big thing that we did at our school is we got two middle schoolers and about four or five high schoolers and asked them questions about workload pressure and, um, and amount of uh, pressure just from the school environment itself and showed it and compiled a big video of all these students saying um, without their teachers there so they could give honest opinions. And, and showed it to teachers on work days or on uh, teacher in-service days when the students weren't there. Um, and just giving the teachers the ability to see what the students are feeling and how, they're, how they aff are affected by the work and the amount of um, pressure that is being put on them. And I think that really served as a big, a big implement for the school. 
And it's exactly why we have you and Mary here on our panel. We believe the students are the ones going through this. They're the major experiencers of school and the pressure that they're under. And we want all students to be part of the solution. Um, and we need our students' voices to be heard um, each day. And it's a very big part of Challenge Success. And it's why we require students to be on the Challenge Success school teams. So um, now you know a little bit about AJ and Mary. Uh, you've heard from Madeline, you've heard from Lisa and myself, and now we want to put what we've said sort of to the test. We want to be able to have you practice some of the tools that we've learned tonight, and back by popular demand, because we didn't do it last year, we are going to do Poll Everywhere. So if you don't know what Poll Everywhere is, so there's been some slides going back and forth, but if you got in a little bit late, I'm going to give you just a little bit of time here to join us. What you want to do is either go to your browser on your phone and type in pollev.com, uh, and it's at the top of the slide here, um, slash CS2019. That's probably the easiest way. If you don't have a data plan, you can participate via text. So you can text the number 787-305-3035. Um, um, is that on there too? Yeah. And then um, you, the first question is basically we want to find out who you are, if you're a student, a parent, or an educator. Some of you are multiple things at once. Just pick one for who you want to be tonight, okay? So we want you to put in your role. Um, and then when we show the answers to our scenarios that we're going to give you, we'll get to see what the students in the audience think, what the parents in the audience think, and what the educators think. So I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to finish joining, and then we'll move on to the first scenario. Make sure you type in your role, and you can ask a buddy if you're having trouble with the poll everywhere. Ask a kid, probably. You can't see the, oh, do you want me to read it again? Okay, so, oh, lower the slide, lower the slide. I can see the slide. Are you saying you can't see the words at the top? Because of the lines. Oh, it's under the thing. Oh, so we can see it, but you can't. Okay, let me just tell it to you. Can you, what can you see? Can you see what is your role? Okay, so let me tell you what it says at the top. Capital P-O-L-L, capital E-V, dot com. So it's pollev.com slash CS2019. I'll say it again. Capital P-O-L-L, capital E, lowercase v, dot com. So capital P, capital E, okay, in pollev slash CS2019. Or you can text CS2019 to this number, 787-305-3035. OK? And if you're not with us, you can sit with a buddy and, and have just as wonderful experience if you're not able to answer. So. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going to move to the first scenario. So, oh, oh, are we going to show how many people are in there? Oh, okay. So we've got about 12% of the people here are students, a big majority are parents, and about a quarter are educators. Okay, are we ready for the first scenario back there? Okay, I'm not sure why it's flashing like that, but okay. All right, we're going to go to the first scenario. I'm going to read this to you. Don't worry if you can't read it. Your daughter was up late last night preparing for a presentation for her sixth period class. You get a text from her at the end of lunch asking if you can excuse her for the rest of the day. She thought she could finish getting her presentation ready at lunch, but she couldn't get everything done and is feeling very stressed. You know that she's been working really hard on other projects all week. This is the second time she's asked this month for you to excuse her from class. The question we want you to answer is, what do you think the parent should do? Let me read it again. I'm going to read it again, and then I'll give you your answer choices, OK? Your daughter was up late last night preparing for a presentation for her sixth period class. You get a text from her at the end of lunch asking if you can excuse her for the rest of the day. 
She thought she could finish getting her presentation ready at lunch, but she couldn't get everything done. She's feeling really stressed. You know she's been working really hard on other projects all week, so she hasn't been mucking around, okay? This is the second time she's asked this month to be excused. Even if you're a, not a parent, if you're a student or a teacher, we want you to answer what you think the parent should do. Should they A, agree to excuse her, B, say no and explain why, C, say no and suggest she talk to her teacher, or D, wait it out and see if she texts again. <laughs> That's the stall tactic. Okay, so go ahead and vote A, B, C, or D. Yeah, there is just like a little sedan. Okay, we are going to see the results here. So um, you can see that the red means A. It looks like the majority of students want to excuse her. Not a lot of people were interested in say no and explain why, but a lot of people were interested, including the students, in say no and suggest that she talk to the teacher. Not surprisingly, 80% of the educators <laughs> asked for that one. And I'm, I'm kind of happy to see that very few people said, wait it out and see if she texts again. And, the, and none of the educators said that, if you notice that. Um, Okay, let's hear what the, what the panelists think. Let's start with a, a, a student. AJ, you have something to say here? Okay, so um, look, after like, hearing about this and everything, um, I, would, I would have been in the red. Um, I know I'm a student, and you can think about that or whatever, but if, if you have a good, honest opinion or a good, honest relationship with your child, and you can tell that the child has been working hard for this length of time, and you've seen, the, you've seen the work that's been put in by the child over this good amount of time, um, and, and she's just not getting done, what, um, the amount, I would, I would excuse her for this one. I, I would kind of combine a couple. Excuse her, but she needs to go figure out what she can do to help lessen her load so she can get everything done to the point where she doesn't have to just keep getting called out of class. So, uh, Lisa, is this um, rescuing? Is this doing what we shouldn't do? This is such a good question because it's really not straightforward. Um, so my first instinct is to go to the three words I think about a lot when this comes up, which is that avoidance feeds anxiety. That, that is one of the fundamental principles in academic psychology, that if you're nervous about something, it's exactly what you were describing. You're nervous, you see the dog, you cross the street, you feel great. All you want to do the next time you see the dog is cross the street. Uh, so, and it's concerning because this is twice now. Yeah. So, my gut as a psychologist is avoidance feeds anxiety. Um, I do think I would be with the majority on the say no but explain why and say I need you to go work this out. Um, but the other thought I have, I'm not really answering the question, I'm just saying I'm stuff. noticing that, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the other thought I have, so occasionally when I'm at a school, I will ask kids what they want me to tell their parents. And sometimes I have them tell me out loud, and sometimes I have them write it down. And I have gotten so much more than I ever would have imagined. Let me deal with the consequences of my choices. Kids saying that to me. Let me deal with the consequences of my choices. So as a psychologist, I think my rationale is avoidance breeds anxiety. As a mom, I actually think I would have been in the pretend like I didn't get the text category. <laughs> yeah, no, and say why, say why. Yeah, okay, okay, high yeah. five, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Madeline. Um, what do I think about this? I, you know, clearly it's, you don't know the age of the child, you don't know, there's a lot you don't know in it. Um, I, I was a working mom, and so my first reaction to it is to text back, honey, I'm at work, talk to you later. Right, <laughs> right. Like, that means they have to deal with it. It's the same thing as not texting back, kind of, because they're just going to have to deal. I'm busy. Yeah. Right, right. And, and, I, and I can't wait to ask him what kind of car he was driving. Yeah. 
where he wasn't hurt. We do not have time for that, Madeline. We have many scenarios you can talk after. <laughs> Mary, how would you answer this? I would like AJ, probably say excuse your daughter because you know she's been working hard all week on other, on other projects in that she's a good student. And I actually think it depends on her relationship with the teacher because like you were explaining before, kids want to do good work for teachers that they like. So if this girl liked her teacher and was comfortable with enough to say, look, I didn't finish my project on time, what are the consequences going to be, I think that would be the first the choice to go to, but also I think parents need to remember that learning is more important than punishment, and I think if I were the parent in this situation, I would let my daughter come home, but sit her down at the table and say, look, we need to figure out why this happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. That way she knows how to avoid it the next time. Uh, spoken like a very wise parent, right? Short term, <laughs> short term, I'm going to give it to you this time. Long term, hey, and you said that too, AJ, like, let's not have this happen again. Let's figure out why, why it's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any last words, Madeline, I, yeah, you want to say something? I just want to say, I, I'm, let's not have this happen again. I mean, it, it's likely to happen again over the course of the kid's education. And I, as usual, my impulse is to say, I want to hear what the kid has to say. Right. Uh, it's not so much that I want to come in and I'm going to solve this for you because your time management isn't very good. I, what, what happened? She's a good student. She's a good kid. Um, tell me about it. Right. My, my instinct is she's probably overloaded. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to get out of something when that's already your life that you're living. But in the long, long range, I would hope that we would look at what she's doing every day, what her extracurriculars are. Uh, is she getting enough sleep? How efficient she is, right? This is a longer term thing. Um, honestly, I have been a recipient of that text and I have waited. And when I actually texted back, because I was in a meeting, not like actually on purpose. And when I texted back, um, uh, I will not say the gender of the child, but the, the child wrote back and said, oh, it's okay, I got it. <laughs> right? So like, it's kind of nice that I didn't have to respond because it allowed them the time to get it. So I actually think all four of those answers, um, there's, there's some good uh, uh, consequences to all of them. Okay, I think we are ready for scenario number two, test trauma. We have a grade now. Your 10th grader took a chemistry test that will have a big impact on the semester grade. He typically gets A's and B's and shares his test grades openly with you. You haven't heard from him. So you go on school loop to check. That's a grading program that you can see your child's grades. And you find out he got a C minus on the chemistry test. What do you think the parent should do? I'm gonna read it again. Your 10th grader took a chemistry test that will have a big impact on the semester grade. He typically gets A's and B's and shares his grades openly with you, but you haven't heard from him. So you go on and check and you find out he got a C minus. What do you think the parent should do? Here are your choices. A, let it go. Trust that this is just an outlier. B, talk to him and share concerns that it could limit his options. <laughs> C, consider hiring a tutor. And D, contact the teacher to see if there are options for improving the grade. This is what the parent should do. <laughs> Go ahead and vote. Okay, why don't we take a look at how this poll turned out. Ooh, let it go. Trust it's an outlier. The educators and the parents and the students, you people are nice. 91%, right? Look at that. There's a small group that was saying, talk to him and share your concerns. And uh, for the students, it's a, a growing one, um, which I think is extremely interesting, where they want the parent to contact the teacher <laughs> to see if there are options for improving the grade. Okay, who, who wants to start us off on this one? Mary, you said you might have something. Yeah, go ahead. 
Okay, well, I think the parent should, like the majority, let it go and trust that it's an outlier. And I think this for many reasons. First, you know your kid is a good student. They get A's and B's. So obviously, it's not in the trend for them to do poorly like they did on the last test. And if you were to hire a tutor or talk to the teacher, it just shows that you don't trust your kid. It shows that you think they're on the downward slope and going obviously away from where they have been. And not necessarily with this student, but I think a lot of kids need to realize that, I mean a lot of parents need to realize that there's a bell curve. And every parent wants their kid to be in the top 10%, but on the bell curve it shows people need to be on the low end, on the high end, and right in the middle. So maybe this kid is just not the best at chemistry, and that's okay. But even I think the parent needs to congratulate how hard the kid worked at studying for the test because overall I think work ethic needs to be applauded over test scores and grades because some of the smartest kids don't put a lick of effort into what they're doing <laughs> and, <laughs> and the kids who are getting B's or C pluses and struggling but working their hardest they have actually accomplished more since that's the best they can do. And I think parents need to alter their expectations and just realize that work ethic is more important than grades because maybe that's the best your kid can do and that's amazing and it just needs to be rewarded. Nicely said, nicely said. <laughs> Lisa, you wanna weigh in? Um, it's very hard to go after Mary and all her wisdom. <laughs> I, I mean, she pretty much Mary. nailed this one. <laughs> um, I think one question I have, and this is a tough one and I'm not going to answer it, is it's just a lot of communicating during the school day in both of these questions. <laughs> and, and I just, I just want to pause on that for a minute. And, and I, yes. I think about this a lot. And, and so I just want to sort of do the 30,000 feet. Like, we need to think about how much conversation is happening when kiddos are at school and their parents are not presumably also at school with them. Um, so I just, I just want to rest on that. I think it's a big one. I think it's a big one. I don't have answers, but I think it's a big one. I think the really straightforward answer here is you have nowhere near enough information to act on this, right? I think the answer is the kiddo comes home and you see what happens. And he might walk through the door and say, whoa, the average was an F? <laughs> I crushed that thing, right? Right. Or... C minus is great. C minus is great. Or... Yeah. I saw my grade, I just want you to know, I already talked to the teacher, I'm going in. I mean, like there's so much material missing. And what I would say, my general life rule, when I don't know what to do, I have found doing nothing is the best choice. Yes. Truly, yes. Yeah. because the data start to roll in. I have never had it happen where doing nothing didn't pay off as more information came in and then the situation clarified. Nice. Madeline. I, I want to say something around that. So. Um, I, I want to frame that a little bit differently um, and, and frame it as listening, um, mm. which I don't think is doing nothing. I think listening is an active thing to do. Um, and I don't think we listen anywhere near enough to kids. You know, we sort of jump on things. I, I mean, I'm sort of, two things about this. Test trauma. I mean, really? T trauma? Uh, trauma. We, we named it like to, you know, <laughs> yeah, kind of be, be funny. To be, to be yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I just recently had a kid walk into my office and tell me she had PTSD because she did poorly on a test, and it's like, honey, you don't have PTSD. That's right. Uh, right. no. Right. Good. So, so th this notion that every everything. It, Think about your own lives. Somebody reminded me, I said this years ago, think about your own lives. If somebody was watching you every second of every day and every word that came in, every bit of performance, it's enough to chill any creativity and enthusiasm you would have. Um, so, I, I, you know, God gave us like one mouth and two ears. That's yeah, like yeah. my point of view. And I just want to put a plug out there uh, around School Loop. It is really the school's responsibility when the kid is doing very poorly. You will know. You do not need to check school loop every day. You probably don't need to check it every week. You probably don't even ever need to check it. <laughs> so 
I want you to think about, you know, who's traumatized by this really, right? And whose anxiety is it really? And um, mom, you got to do something with your time that you're not checking school loop. So AJ, last word, and we're moving on to the next scenario. Yeah, so I would, just like everybody else, I'd definitely let it go. But if you see it, obviously this is the first time, but if you see it happen as a repeated at, um, effort at some point, um, then that's when you would sit down with the student. Maybe he does, isn't getting chemistry, like in this scenario, and then you go get a tutor. But the whole contacting the um, teacher, the parent being the contact, um, I'm sorry, but that it definitely should be the student being the contact because once you get to college, your parent, I hope your parent will not be emailing your professors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. um, but if um, you just have to be able to be in a scenario where you know you're going to be able to do the work instead of your parents because one day you're going to be in a situation where your parents aren't holding you, um, holding your hand the whole way. So um, that's, that's mine. Well said. Well said. Thank you, AJ. Okay, last scenario. We're going to do this a little bit more quickly. Your child is a passionate gamer. They use their skills to raise money for charity and are considering colleges that have esports teams. Yes, these do exist. <laughs> they are a strong student. They compete on the tennis team, they play in the jazz band, but you're worried they're spending too much time alone in their room honing their gaming skills. Last weekend, they were awake until 4 a.m. as part of an esports tournament and then slept through an important family event the next day. You're starting to worry about their health and well being. What should the parent do? I'll read it again quickly. Child is a passionate gamer, using their skills for charity. They are a strong student, they're in extracurriculars, but you're worried they're spending too much time, up way too late, missed an important family event. Okay, here's your options. As a parent, you should let them be there pursuing their passion. B, tell them they're doing too much and need to drop an activity. Or C, take charge and set stricter limits on their screen time and bedtime. Try to vote quickly so we can get a good discussion in. <laughs> How are we doing? We got enough to pull a slide up? Ooh, this is kind of a split one. This is interesting. The majority is still uh, there with the um, take charge, set stricter limits on their screen time and bedtime. But we've got a good chunk of students that say let them be there pursuing their passion. And we've got... Um, uh, about a quarter of the adults saying uh, make them drop an activity. Let's hear from the students. AJ, start us off. Okay, so I, I would be in the 17 percentile of the students. Um, uh, I would definitely say have them drop something. That doesn't necessarily mean drop the video gaming or it's just drop an activity overall. This, obviously the student is overpacked, probably obviously not getting enough sleep, and with the personal experience I have, sleep is extremely important. So yes. dropping, dropping something in this scenario would be the most ideal. Um, just pursuing your passions still leaves that gap where, A, family time is really important, especially to my family. We all always, we have dinner every night together as a family. We watch some TV shows on Monday and Wednesday nights together. Like family time, being with the dogs and the family, that's extremely important to us. So. Um, definitely need to drop something, not necessarily one sp certain thing, but let them make the choice of what would be best for them. Thank you, AJ. Madeline, you wanna? Um, I'm, I don't know, because he slept till four o'clock, he was up till four, is that once, is that a hundred times, is he exhausted or not exhausted? So, you know, if I had a kid who was interested in a lot of stuff, um, I think that's good. Uh, if he's it could be a she too, Malin. We purposely didn't put a, a, a gender. Sorry, I just want to point that out. So it's oh. he or she or well, non-binary. But, but Lisa says she because she has daughters, and I have three sons. No so problem. I say I'm he. just pointing that out <laughs> to the audience. 
inclusive. I'm just trying. Yes, go ahead. It's just habit. Yes, you know, practice. I hear you. you have to practice, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I really don't have anything smart to say about it because you're, you're, you're starting to worry about their health. And, I, and I, in a way, it's a nice emblematic thing of your wor you worry quickly. We all worry quickly. And um, sometimes that's, that's reasonable and sometimes it's not. Usually what we, as psychologists, what do we look for first in kids? We look for psychosomatic symptoms, headaches and stomach aches and stuff like that. There's just not enough to tell me um, if it's a problem or not. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, that, that's okay. <laughs> I would want to know if he felt or she felt it was a problem. Yeah. Right. What would be very interesting to me would be the stance of this child upon waking after sleeping through the family event, mm -hmm. because that's really going to set us down one path or another, right? And if there's no problem, that's just how we're going to do it. Okay, then there we have a problem. Um, and if the child says, whoa, that's not working, then I think the adult can stand back and trust that the child will sort it out and find their own solution. So I, I think that I would wait for that moment to see what happens mm -hmm. when this child wakes up. Mary. I totally agree with you, and I think it's very important to see the child's perspective on this, because obviously your child is a very passionate gamer, but is spread way too thin. Who knows if they're actually passionate about the jazz band or the AP courses they're taking. Maybe they're just doing this, these things because they think they're expected to. And along with AJ, I would also probably be in the 17% here and tell them that they're doing too much because along with my family, family time is very important and I think sacrificing that for something that maybe he's not putting, putting too much time in for because he's spread too thin with other activities is, it's just kind of a hot mess because I think family time goes along with finding a balance between childhood and adulthood, and I think being a well-balanced student, he needs to allocate time for all sorts of things. So if you, were tell, if you were to tell this child that they're doing too much, I think it would relieve pressure, because who knows if they feel like they're doing too much, who knows if they think they're trying to hold up these expectations, but you also need to, like you were saying, see where the child's perspective is, because if he feels like gaming is his life's passion, then you need to let him do that too, even if you do not understand it. Okay, it's hard to follow Mary, but I do want to say she's been saying family time and play time and downtime, and that comes from a challenge success mantra that we have. And if you don't know that, and you saw some slides on this early on, um, it's PDF. And it turns out if you look at the research on protective factors, all kids, preschool all the way up, even adults, need playtime, downtime, and family time every day. Um, and what that looks like for each kid is different. So gaming could be really playtime for this, for this kid. And he's passionate, and he's fascinated, and he's motivated in Lisa's terms. Um, and jazz band and tennis might be things he's doing for his resume. Or he could love them all, and we have to have a, a conversation that this isn't working, right? The downtime, including sleep, but also time throughout the day to take a breather, to, to, to meditate, to find a moment to um, talk to a friend. This is why we're so excited that schools are lengthening their, their passing periods and building in tutorials and free periods for kids because it's just a crazy roller coaster without a break and you need to take breaks every day. And then the F is for family time, which we've heard from, from both. I love that you watch TV together, that you play with the dogs, that family meals are so important. It turns out that's a real protective factor for kids. So if you're going to leave here tonight, I think there's some key lessons just to summarize it and, and, and wrap up. Playtime, downtime, family time, every day for your kid. If you're not someone who does family dinners, start small and get that going, right? Put your kids to bed. We heard from Lisa, it's in her top five. Get the technology out of the bedroom. Um, don't rescue, don't, don't, don't protect uh, uh, from fears that, they could, that you could slowly expose them to, but also know when it is time for recovery, 
right, and, and putting down the weights and, and taking a day off. Um, and that's why these scenarios were not cut and dry, because it's hard, and it's going to present itself to you, and you're going to have to make that on-the-spot decision, which might be do nothing and listen, um, but you're also going to have to then look at the big picture and have, in the long term, we don't want this happening again, and here's why, and we're going to talk about it. So um, lots of lessons. For, for all of you tonight. Any uh, final words here from the panel before I, I say a quick thank you? Okay, good, yay, well that worked out. All right, well thank you, all of you, all 1,500 of you. Thanks our panelists, the wonderful AJ, Mary, Lisa, and Madeline. A few really quick announcements. Watch for a follow-up email with a link to a really short survey about your experience. We want you to take it. We listen to you. If you have friends on the East Coast, we are doing a very similar evening with Lynn Lyons at Bentley University on October 11th. We'll see some of you at our November 4th fundraiser. If you liked what you saw tonight, join our social media, get our newsletters. Thank you to all the sponsors and guests who made it possible. As a nonprofit, all your gifts at whatever level matter, so you can visit our website if you so choose to make a donation. We are gonna go sign some books. Thank you to the Stanford Bookstore for making those available. School team members, all 400 of you, 8.30 a.m. breakfast, back at Paul Breast. Remember your name tags and your folders. If you're a returning team, you're gonna get your folder tomorrow. Everybody go home, tell your kids you love them, listen to them, and then put them to bed.